Before we look into the passage that we're going to study today, as always, we should pray and ask God to bless us with understanding. Father in heaven, may your Holy Spirit, who inspired the words we're about to look into, be present with us now to help us understand, to help us apply them to our own lives. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Uh, there was a, an incident which happened in Canada. It was a United States evangelist, a very popular televangelist, who was writing letters to people looking for support. And apparently if people got on the mailing list, he would actually write to them um, personally and ask them for large sums of money. And he found that, like many others do, some of the best resources of money are elderly people. And uh, he used this to his advantage. In this case, it was only a $200 donation he was seeking from this woman, but she was very old, very poor, and uh, lived in the care of others. And so what happened was the letter found its way into the hands of a reporter who ended up publishing the letter in the newspaper, the local newspaper. Well, when the word got out that this, you know, they read this letter, which was very, very uh, harsh and really kind of um, pushy in demanding money from this woman, that didn't look very well. You know, it didn't look good at all for the evangelist. So he defended himself by saying God had, him, had instructed him to send that letter to the woman. The interesting thing is that... Uh, the woman had been dead for three months already. I don't know that God would instruct him to write a letter to a dead woman and exact $200 from her. We hear these stories and it makes us cringe. It makes us sick, or it should, when we see people who exploit others in the name of religion, especially the poorest and the weakest, the most helpless. Um, we know that these things happen. I have a number of stories that I could share with you. I won't share them all. Um, but in one case, an evangelist was doing a similar thing with older folks and saying, you know, that if, if they didn't pay something toward his ministry, that Satan would take advantage of them and hit them with bad things, you know, like poor health and uh, family problems for their children and grandchildren. And they would wish they had never been born, it would be so bad. On the other hand, though, he stated, through the gift of prophecy, he had been told that if recipients would give to him they could expect creative miracles, things that were seemingly dead in their body, their spirit and their mind and their finances would once again come alive because they were giving to his ministry of God's work. Those may be legal tactics, but they are far from Christian. Today, as we think about women who were exploited, a poor widow, um, in this passage, we realize that that kind of exploitation still goes on today in the name of religion, and it's most unfortunate. Jesus hated it when he saw it, and he had something to say about it. But we read prior to this passage in Mark 12, leading up to it, we're going to start at verse 38, where Jesus warns against the experts in the law. Now, Jesus was doing some people watching at this point. As we read through this section of, of the book of Mark, we noticed that Jesus was on the defense, right? Group after group after group was coming to him and nailing him with one question after another, trying to make him look foolish, trying to discredit him in any way they could out in public. And Jesus was answering well, he was sharp, and they couldn't defeat this man in public debate. Now, Jesus is going to turn the tables. And rather than being on the defense, we're going to see Jesus forward on the offense. Verse 38. In his teaching, Jesus also said, watch out for the experts in the law, or the scribes. They were the experts in the law. So now, instead of just answering their questions and defending himself and his own authority, he's on the attack, and he's telling everyone who's present, look out for these guys. <laughs> There's somebody that you have to watch out for. They like walking around in long robes and a... Elaborate greetings in the marketplace. 
These long robes that they were, would wear were, resembled uh, priestly robes that would be worn in temple duty. They went down almost to the feet. They had lots of fringes. They were clearly um, indicative that these people were scribes. Okay? They were religiously standing out, and they were supposed to be respected. But they had no reason to wear them around. If they, you know, they wore them around the marketplace. They just wanted to be seen. It would be comparable to, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a young doctor who loved to wear his lab coat and his stethoscope out, out you know, he'd go out to lunch or whatever and say, I'm a doctor, you know. <laughs> he, he just graduated and he, and he wants the world to know. And he wore it like a badge of honor. Well, this is what they would do. They would wear their robes not because they were serving in any function as a scribe, but just because they wanted to be noticed, I am a scribe. In addition to this, as I just mentioned, they loved these elaborate greetings out in the marketplace. Scribes were supposed to be treated a certain way according to Jewish law. When one passed by, everybody was, and Jews obviously, Gentiles would ignore these rules, but a Jew was supposed to stand in the presence of a scribe who was passing by. You get up. And you pay respect to this guy because he's somebody greater than you. Not only that, but they were supposed to be addressed with certain titles. You know what the titles were? They might be addressed as rabbi, which simply meant teacher. That's not so bad. But they were also fond of receiving uh, these. This title was what they were called. They'd like to be called master and father. Seems to me Jesus had something to say about that, didn't he? <laughs> Call no man your master or father. Speaking in Jesus' day, he was speaking of what was going on with the, the scribes. Today, obviously, we can apply that as well. There are people who like to receive that kind of um, acknowledgement. They like to be called father in a religious sense. Jesus says, don't do that. You have a heavenly father. And you have no master other than God. So these guys were the ones Jesus is talking about when he says, watch out for the scribes, the experts in the law. They walk around in their long flowing robes, which, by the way, indicates they're not in a hurry and they're not doing any work because you couldn't work in those robes. They were basically saying, we are part of the leisure class of society, and they were proud of it. They love... Elaborate greetings in the marketplaces, verse 39, and the best seats in the synagogue. Now, I know here in church, many people think the best seats are not up front here. You know, if you were at a sporting event, that would be the best seat. Uh, but uh, the best seats in the synagogue in Jesus' day were not just like the front pew. They were actually the seats right by whoever was teaching or leading out. And it was, it was a bench up front but they wouldn't be facing the teacher. They would be facing the congregation. It's kind of like, you know, when you go to church and you have elders sitting up here in these seats and how important they are. You know, they're, they're very important people in the church. To me, I always, I, you know, none of our elders, do you notice these seats are not occupied? <laughs> I don't want you to see their heads bobbing as they fall asleep while I'm preaching. But, but really, uh, it's much better for them to be sitting with their fellow believers or families out here, right? But that was the idea. There was a bench where they could sit and face everybody else, and everybody would see them and recognize how important they are as they looked out over the congregation wearing their long robes, <coughs> commanding respect. And afterward, you would stand and call them father or master. Jesus had no use for such nonsense. He said, not only did he condemn it, he said, watch out. That means, when I say watch out, you're, you, you expect danger. You know, there's something to be aware of. And Jesus was saying, these guys are dangerous. Watch out for them. There's danger here. Reading on. What's so bad about them? Verse 40. They devour widows' property. Now, what does it mean to devour a widow's property? Well, the scribes were never to be paid for their duties. Never to be paid for their expertise in the law. 
They were to have another trade, like Paul, who was a tent maker. That's where he made his income. However, they happily received any donations that people might make to them for their services. And it got to the place where they did more than receive donations, but expected them. <clears throat> and actually, in their work, since they were kind of like the lawyers for the religious society, they were often doing legal work for the religious society. For instance, a father might set, up, uh, set aside an amount of money for his daughter, like an inheritance. Now, if she would never marry or would become a widow, that money would be hers to help her survive if she had no husband and no son. For instance, the widow of Nain, when her child was restored to her, it wasn't just like, oh, thank God I've got my child back. No, that was her sustenance. A widow needed a son to care for her because only men were wage earners. So, a father who's forward-thinking may say, well, I'll set up a trust fund, as it were, for my daughter so that should she never marry or should her husband die before she does, that will be there for her and she can live off it, kind of like receiving a monthly pension. It would be doled out. But who's going to care for that? Women couldn't do the banking. Women weren't involved. So you had to ask some man to be in charge of that. And the ones who were asked were the lawyers of the church, the scribes, the experts in the law. And so when Jesus says they devour widows' houses or widows' properties, this could be very well what he's referring to. A scribe who's responsible for administering those regular payments could skim off the top as much as he want, perhaps more than 50%, and feel that he's not doing anything wrong. Did the priests know this was going on? Absolutely. Did they care? Not as long as they got their cut of the you know, piece of the pie as well, going toward them and the temple. So you remember Jesus, this section we've been looking at for the last couple of months actually, Jesus is doing what? He opens up, after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he opens up this section, or Mark opens it up for us and shows us, Jesus does the first thing is what? After his triumphal entry. He goes in, checks out the temple. Goes home, doesn't pronounce judgment immediately. Remember, with God, judgment doesn't always come right away. But he was examining, there was an investigative judgment going on. And then the next day, he comes in, and by the way, you remember the whole thing about the withered fig tree? A clear example, the temple wasn't pr producing fruit, and there would be a curse upon it, and there would be consequences for it. And so Jesus comes in, and then he begins turning over money tables, driving out the money changers, and we noted that sometimes this is called the second cleansing of the temple, but probably it's not to be considered a cleansing because Jesus was basically saying the temple, there's no need to cleanse something that is no longer useful. It was as if he was condemning it and shutting it down. It was his, um, his judgment upon the temple. So he that's, this section opens with his judgment upon the temple, then there's all those challenges to his authority, and then some teaching, and now as he wraps it up, he's once again condemning what goes on in the name of religion there at the temple. Scribes devouring the property of widows. Widows were supposed to be the ones we looked out for, the weakest, the most uh, important for us to care about and care for. And yet they saw no problem with taking advantage of a helpless widow for their own benefit. If you want to know what God expected of widows, we could read the Bible of Jesus. And there are many passages which speak to this, but we'll choose one. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. This is the Bible Jesus read, the Old Testament, we call it today. And it's the Bible that the Jews would have read. And here's what it had to say about our relationship to widows. As God's people, this is how we should act toward them. It's mentioned in this passage, Isaiah 10, 1 through 4. Those who enact unjust policies are as good as dead. Those who are always instituting unfair regulations to keep the poor from getting fair treatment and to, to deprive the oppressed among my people of justice so they can steal what widows own and loot what belongs to orphans. You see, this problem is not a new one. People have always preyed upon the weakest. 
selfish individuals looking for their own personal gain will go to the, to the easiest target. Verse 3, what will you do on judgment day? When destruction arrives from a distant place, to whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your wealth? You will have no place to go except to kneel with the prisoners or to fall among those who have been killed. Despite all this, his anger does not subside and his hand is ready to strike again. You see, what we notice is Jesus is showing us the wrath of God. Oh, I know, we love the paintings of Jesus and the, little, the pictures of Jesus in our kids' storybooks where he's gentle and mild and kind and compassionate, which he was all of that. But if you don't get the pictures of Jesus, I would just love, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen one. I'd love to see a picture of Jesus, anger, I mean anger, steaming in his face, turning over money tables or furious as he speaks about the, the, the scribes who devour widows' properties. Where are those paintings? Because if we don't have them, we miss one very important aspect of the character of God. And Jesus did exemplify the wrath of God when he taught. Now, if you remember from a previous time when we talked about this, the wrath of God is not like God losing his temper and blowing his top. It's not uncontrolled anger that overflows. No, the wrath of God is calculated judgment against evil and wrongdoing. It's quite controlled. God is not losing control, but his righteous indignation is being expressed against wickedness. Is that a bad thing? I would submit to you that someone who doesn't get angry over evil is a bad person. We can't have this picture of Jesus always being meek and mild and never... You know, God's people should get angry about some things. If we don't, apathy means we're not good people. What kind of father is it that always loves his little child no matter what? No matter what that child may be doing, he smiles at the disobedience. That's the worst of fathers or the worst of mothers. A parent, the requirement of parenthood demands that you be stern and strict when, when it is demanded. And God has two sides to his character. There's love and mercy, yes, but there's also justice, judgment, and wrath against evil. And we're seeing it now in this passage as it wraps up. Jesus is making it clear <laughs> He's not going to stand for this, and he wants everybody else to know, you better watch out. These are dangerous folks. Watch out for the scribes, because this is what they do. They walk around in long robes and elaborate greetings. They love that, walking around and having elaborate greetings in the marketplaces, and the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' property. And as a show, make long prayers. Now that, and as a show, phrase in the Greek is very interesting. Because it could well be translated this way. As a show, they make long prayers. Okay, they're showing off it. Look at me. But it could also go with the preceding phrase. It could be saying, and they cover up what they're doing. And make long prayers. So to cover up all the evil that was just mentioned in the preceding part, the devouring of widows' homes, they cover it all up with long prayers. One of the most frustrating things for me to have dealt with over my years in ministry is, is on the occasion meeting people who have religious pretense and their lives don't show the fruit of, of Jesus Christ's spirit working in their lives. That is frustrating to me. They may be the one that sings the loudest. You know, that different people have different scripts that they, they play out in, in this playing church or being religious act. Sometimes it's, you know, um, they're the most zealous 
in their um, holy living, whatever they define holy living as. Sometimes they're the ones who like you to know, I, I gave this much so that we could have that or whatever, you know, in the church. Or sometimes it, it's something else, you know, whatever it may be. They all have their thing that they do. Now, is it good to sing out praises to God with a loud voice? Absolutely. Is it good to live a holy life and in every detail submit yourself to the will of God so that you can be saying, Lord, in all ways I live, I want to glorify you? Absolutely. Is it good to give generously to the church? Absolutely. Is it good to do it for a pretense to cover up a hollow, dead spiritual experience that you don't have, or that you don't have a real spiritual experience? That's the worst kind of sin. When you try to fool others, and you also think you're fooling God. That's the worst. What could be worse? And Jesus says, I'm not standing for it. I want you to be aware this is bad stuff. Watch out for it. These men, he says, will receive a more severe punishment. Did you hear what he said? I want you to notice. You never hear that kind of condemnation anywhere from Jesus' lips against whom the religious people think as sinners. You don't hear him speak that way about prostitutes, about drunkards, about tax collectors. He says the worst condemnation, the ones who are going to be damned in the worst way, is whom? The religious phonies. Now that's pretty interesting. That's the wrath of God that we see demonstrated in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'd better never forget that that's a very real part of his holy and perfect character. That's part of his holy and perfect character. We deceive ourselves and we put ourselves in a dangerous place if we're, all, if we're thinking God's love is all warm and fuzzy love and there's never any judgment for wrongdoing. Jesus never taught that way. Now, interestingly, what follows is this passage here um, about the widow and her offering. Then he sat down opposite the offering box. This would have been in the court of the women. He may have not been there, but the offering boxes were in the court of the women. They were called shofars. You know what the shofar is? The ram's horn that is blown? Because they had kind of a trumpet-shaped top to these offering boxes. There were 13 of them. And these 13 had different labels on them. You could give to this, that, or the other thing. There were actually seven specific things. You could give uh, to the offering for frankincense, for the priest to burn in the temple service. You could give an offering for wood to be used in consuming you know, the fires for the sacrifice. You could give an offering for whole bird offerings or for half bird offerings. You could give an offering for uh, gold to be used in the, at the mercy seat. Uh, you could be, I can't remember all of them, but there were offerings for different things, right? And then there were six that were labeled free will offerings. So I imagine, you know, seven, one on the end, one on the end, and then every other one is a free will offering. And the free will offering then was to be used, and that's where most people who were poor would put their offerings. That's kind of like the general offering. So think of it like your offering envelope there, tied an offering envelope before you in the pew. You can give to, you know, various things. You lay, there's lines there that you can fill out, and you make your choices. If you just put it in there and don't label it for anything, it's going to go to where it's needed most in the local budget. But people had choices to make. And so Jesus sits back where he can watch. Now, the court of women wasn't just for women. That meant that's as far as the women could go, but men could be there too. Remember, the outside part was the court of the Gentiles. They could go no further, and, and it was quite clear. Remember, we talked about the signs that were there, basically saying, if any Gentile dares pass this point, we're not responsible for what may happen to you. You're taking your life in your own hands. I'm paraphrasing, but that's really what it communicated. It wasn't, I'm not stretching it too much. They were telling you, your life's in danger if you're a Gentile and you pass this point. Well, the women had a limit to where they could go as well. And then that was where the offering places were. The men could go beyond that. 
So these shofars, these 13 offering boxes are there, and Jesus found a place to sit by somewhere. I don't know where. Do you like to watch people? You ever go to the mall and watch people? You know, guys, your wife is shopping, and you find a comfortable seat, and it's like, okay, this is great. Let her shop. I've got a comfortable seat. And then you watch people. And it's so interesting. To I mean, I learn a lot about people just by watching. I'm a people watcher. I love to do it. One of my favorite activities, the time that I spent there studying in Jerusalem, was to sit by the Damascus Gate and watch people. It was one of the main thoroughfares in and out of the old city of Jerusalem. And at the Damascus Gate, because of where it was located, you had both Jews and, or, and Arabs using it. Jews and Muslims coming and going through this Damascus Gate. It was really interesting to watch people there. But Jesus was sitting and watching from a distance what's going on as people are giving. Now, you can learn a lot about people by the way they give. Imagine you're sitting in church this morning when the offering was collected, and somebody next to you reaches into his or her jacket pocket, and says, <coughs> you know, makes some attention, gets your attention by the motions and noises they make, and then places their offering envelope face up into the collection plate so that you can see the amount, and it's boldly written in big numbers. And they put it off to the side a little bit, you know, so it's sticking out so nobody else can cover it up. So, and you see their name in bold letters. And, and come on. I mean, we don't do that, right? But that's kind of what it was like when Jesus was watching these people giving their gifts. He was noticing the way that they did it. How did they do it? Remember I told you these were trumpet-shaped? And it says they were throwing. That's a good translation. They were throwing their offerings into the offering box. Because many times, we, we understand from other writings, Jesus didn't spell it out here, or Mark didn't spell it out for us, but we know this is what happened. People would make a show by tossing coins maybe not one at a time, but a whole bunch of them, toss them into there so it goes clank, 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 and it's rattling around in there, making a lot of noise, and everybody who's nearby goes, you hear that, and then you see this man with long robes, perhaps, walking past as he just gave his offering. That's the kind of thing Jesus was watching. They were giving for show. They wanted everybody to notice. Look how good and holy I am because of how much I've given. Sometimes, it seems, they would toss it in from a distance so that this coin could gleam in the sunlight on its way before it clanked into the thing. And all of that's going on, and Jesus doesn't have much to say about it, but he notices something else. Because in contrast to all of that in the front of this magnificent structure, gleaming white marble, gold edifice, and, and all of the elaborate markings and engravings, in contrast to that magnificent structure and these showy givers, comes this poor little widow. widow. Now the, whim, the word poor there in the Greek, tokos, it's a, there's different words for poor. This one means like hand-to-mouth poor. So poor that, you know, every day she was relying on, I got to get something today to eat. That kind of poor. She was really poor, what we might call dirt poor. Jesus notices her coming along, probably feeling so small and insignificant and relatively unimportant, like a nobody in that crowd of great givers. But she comes along and drops two coins in. I've got two of them here. A lepton is the smallest coin, Jewish coin. It was a tiny copper coin. Lepta is the plural. It says she put in two lepta. I mean, they're almost nothing. These are from the time of Christ. So it would be interesting to think about whose hands held these, what they were spent on, if they were ever perhaps placed in an 
offering box at the temple. But here they are, two small lepta. You know how much they're worth? Mark, since he's writing primarily to Romans, translates it and says about a quadrants, which is the smallest Roman coin. Two of these would equal one quadrant, which is about one sixty-fourth of a day's labor, the denarius. So that's just to make it easy, let's say that a good hard day of labor would earn a day labor, a manual labor, $64, just for simplicity's sake. We'll put it today like, okay, you work all day, I'm going to pay you $64. This would be $1. It would be the equivalent of slipping a dollar into the offering plate and feeling pretty insignificant when you compare it to the big gifts that others might have made. I'm going to let you pass these around. If uh, you're all promising to get them back to me because they're worth a lot, <laughs> take a look at them. Hold them in your hand and think of that poor widow. Now, Jesus noticed her. That won't make very much noise if you drop that into, you know, you can throw it as hard as you want at that horn-shaped top of the box, and it's going to make a tiny little clink. But Jesus noticed that she gave more than all the others. Let's read how he puts it. He's sitting there watching people. Then he sat down opposite the offering box and watched the crowd putting coins into it. Many rich people were throwing in large amounts. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, worth less than a penny. Now, let's just contrast something. In Matthew 6, 2, remember what Jesus said? When you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Or is it the other way around? But, you, you know, you give quietly. And what were they doing? <laughs> or clanking, because they wanted everybody to know. Jesus says, don't be like that. Do it secretly. Because it's not for others to know. It's for your Heavenly Father to know. Verse 43, he called his disciples and said to them, I tell you the truth. Now, this is one of those verily, verily stay, sayings. You know, when Jesus begins with truly, truly, verily, verily, Amen, amen, your Bible may translate it. Here it says, I tell you the truth. It means, I'm going to share something with you that's really important for you to get. Pay attention to this, because I really want you to understand it. I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the offering box than all the others. Obviously, we know he's not speaking literally, because what she put in is almost nothing. It could hardly contribute to anything. Maybe it could go toward, um, you know, pennies on the dollar add up, and it could maybe be used uh, to help cover the expense of 30 pieces of silver for an important future transaction that would take place when the priests would pay Judas to betray his Lord. We don't know how they were used. And this brings up an important question for us. If Jesus says she put in more than the others because she gave out of her poverty, but they gave out of their wealth, in other words, percentage-wise, she gave the most. They could skim off the top and give a huge gift, but it wouldn't really hurt. It hardly mattered to them. She had two. Now, if you had two, you might want to keep one. Do you ever hear the story about the the um, kid who had an offering to give, the parent gave him some money and said, now you take this to your Sabbath school for your offering. And you know how parents send their kids to church, but they don't go? In the old days, they could walk up, you know, you walk down to church and gave the money, here's two quarters for you. You can have one to stop and get some candy or ice cream on the way home after church. But one is to put in the Sunday school or Sabbath school offering plate. Okay? Johnny says, yeah, that's fine. Okay. And he's on his way, and he trips on his way to church, and one quarter roll, they both roll out of his hands. One quarter rolls down into the drain by the street, and the other quarter stays on the street. He picks it up, and he says, Lord, I'm sorry. That was your quarter that rolled into the thing. You know, this is mine. 
The woman could have kept one of those small copper coins, kept a lepton for herself. But notice, she had only two, and she gave them both. No wonder Jesus said she gave everything she had. Now, if that's all she had to live on, that's not much of a meal either. So what she was doing, in essence, was saying, God, I'm going to trust you to provide for my needs. What little I have, I'm giving it all to you, because if I have any need, you're going to have to provide for me anyway. I'm trusting you. I'm not going to hoard my little bit and try to get more to, to add to it. Father, it's yours. But this brings up an important question. Is it right for a poor widow to contribute all she has to such a corrupt system as the temple system? Jesus had condemned it. Jesus pointed out all that was wrong with it and all that was wrong with those who were receiving the benefit of that offering. And yet, there she was, giving it. Jesus doesn't get into that. He simply commends her for her faithfulness in giving. Many times, we may be tempted to question, why should I continue paying the offering, right? I don't think it's being used the way it should, or why should I pay tithe? I don't agree with what the conference is doing. But Jesus doesn't address this at all. He simply says, notice the spirit of her giving. She didn't know how else to use it or where else to go with it, but if I want to give it to God, the avenue through which it came was to the temple. They would answer for their abuse of the funds, not she, because she gave generously to God. Can I just take a moment and talk about tithes and offerings since we're, since we're here on that? How far did the coins get? Where are they? Okay, so I have to keep talking longer until they get up here to the front again. Don't take too long with those because you're lengthening the sermon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> look how quickly they're passing them now. <laughs> no, uh, you can keep passing them during the closing hymn, so don't worry. Uh, the thing that I want to share is that Malachi is clear that we're to be giving tithes and offerings. Not paying, but giving tithe and offerings, right? That's a pretty good deal when you think about it. Tithe simply means a tenth. If God says, I own everything and everything you have is a gift from me, and he says, I just want you to return one-tenth of it. We're like business partners. I'm going to bless you. You give one-tenth in return. And then above that, give an offering. Because Malachi says that we can rob the Lord in tithes. Or the Lord speaking through Malachi says, how have you robbed me? In tithes and in offerings. So please understand that we're not expected to just pay a tithe. We're expected to pay tithe and offerings. Tithe goes to the work of ministry. It pays, it goes, whatever tithe you give here, none of it stays here. It goes on to the conference, and then they work it through the system all the way up to the general conference level, and it's distributed to pay pastors, teachers, and administrators, those who work in the work of ministry. Offerings, on the other hand, can be given to organizations like ADRA, you know, or um, Christian Record Services, today's offering, or any number of our ministries around the world, and offerings can be given locally. This church functions on your offerings. What you give helps us to pay the utilities, helps to pay for the paper that your bulletin's printed on, helps to provide paper towels to dry your hands, Everything, the, the landscaping, the maintenance. So I just want to get that out there. As we talk about giving, we give tithes and offerings to the work of the Lord. But Jude, uh, Jesus notices this woman and says that she gave out of her poverty and put in what she had to live on, everything she had. God notices what we do when no one else does. There's no indication that Jesus ever spoke to that woman. She didn't know Jesus was watching. He was off at a distance somewhere, people watching from a distance, and she probably was trying to slip up quietly, put that in there, and he calls his sister, look at this, notice, notice. Look what that woman has done, and they all turn. 
you know, they were probably enamored with what they saw of the big givers giving with their flowing robes. And Jesus says, forget all that. I want you to pay attention to that poor little widow. Now, how did he know she was a poor widow? How did he know that was all she had? Maybe by divine insight. Maybe there was some other way he found out. But he drew attention to her because that's the way he wants us to give. Please don't go away from here thinking that I told you that God wants you to give your entire paycheck this week or next month and then you end up out on the street. That's not the point Jesus is making. He's making a point that she gave sacrificially. I read the story this week of a man who felt deeply for the plight of a poor widow, had no way to support herself, and he went around asking for people, can you help? Can you help this poor woman? What can you give to her needs? And one after another of his acquaintances, and strangers even, would say, oh, I feel very sorry for her, but I'm sorry, I just can't afford to give. Well, the last person that he was going to see was a, a, a very wealthy acquaintance. Didn't know him well, but he went to him and said, Sir, I feel I know you well enough to ask you. I have a burden on my heart for this poor widow. She has a great need. Could you help? And he apologized and said, I'm sorry, I, I just can't give. The man's face sank as he heard the words, and he said, please, the, the, the rich man said, please understand, I do really feel for this woman. I feel for her. And the gentleman said, I don't question that you feel for her. It just seems to me that you don't feel for her in the right place. The wealthy man said, oh, no, no, I do. I feel for her deep down in my heart. And the man said, that's what I thought. <laughs> I was hoping you'd feel it way down in your pocket. <laughs> you know, what we do with our money is a good barometer of where our hearts really are, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying give to it hurts. I'm not doing that kind of a thing with you today. What I am saying is that we should prayerfully consider what we give and how we give. Because we can give till it hurts and begrudge it the whole time. But God loves a cheerful giver. Let us give with a cheerful heart. That's probably more important than how much we give, isn't it? But let's give. Let's give. And I'm not saying that because you're supporting me by giving tithe, because the church needs your givings. Those things are true, obviously. But the greatest concern I have as your pastor is that you give because that's what God wants you to do. And Jesus notices, just like he noticed that poor widow. He notices and he wants to see that your heart is in the right place as you give.